Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to never miss an episode of In the Design Lounge. On this episode of In the Design Lounge, Doug Demers, Managing Principal of Seattle's b and Architects, joins us to talk about the value of visual communication in design, his appreciation for sci-fi icon James Tiberius Kirk, and the firm's controversial proposal to replace an out-of-commission West Seattle bridge with a timber and steel hybrid design. I think I, and I read you were saying return on architecture, which is a different, you know, you look at it in the business, you, you, you are, I always talk about ROI, right? Yeah. With marketing and branding, like what's the ROI? And then starting from that perspective, your return on architecture is a little bit different. How do you feel like that's different with how you guys look at it, b and with design? Um, Cause I think, I know you even mentioned before you even get the design, before you even plan it out, you need to understand, you know, what are the objectives of the business? What are you, what are the results? And then how does that go back into the, into the design and how do you guys, how do you guys create the design? If you can help a client see where they want to go, mm-hmm. um, and designers actually have some really, and of course this is all this is all cool and and on trend now with business schools, you know, yeah. the, design, the big D. Yeah. Um, but but designers have all, have been always been trained to listen and and be able to communicate visually. Mm-hmm. Well, in a fast moving business environment uh, with white water everywhere. That's a hugely valuable ability. And so what we focus on is using that ability to, to um, orchestrate a, a team of, of different stakeholders and to use visual and graphic tools to help them see large and complex information sometimes, but quickly and easy, easily sliced and diced to be able to get to an aligned, you know, what are the obvious goals, objectives, and and what does winning look like for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, what does the right solution look like? And then when you do that, the design part actually can focus on, it doesn't have to focus so much on the, the key organizational or business objectives. It can focus on how do we come up with creativity? How do we iterate with this client? To, it, it lets you go a lot deeper and have a much richer palette to, to work from. Um, so you think that foundation then actually opens you up to more creativity as yeah, opposed yeah. to, because I think someone would actually look at that and be like, okay, if we start from the objectives, that would limit or constrict potential creativity within the design. But you're saying the opposite. It actually opens it up even more. I, I think it opens up more and you're solving the things that matter. Gotcha. With the design solutions. And and a lot of times, I don't know, this is just a thing I, I always think about a pearl. A pearl is created because a, a a piece, a bit of sand is annoying the, the, the host. <laughs> so I, I think great design often comes out of challenging circumstances. Hi, kids. Look at the design inspiration. Plump with resources, eye candy, and meaningful stories galore. That's the gray magic. With extra scoops of architecture, heaps of interior design, mouthfuls of fashions, sprinkled with landscape design and drizzled with product design, Gray, an international design magazine, is good for you. Tell mom to subscribe to Gray Magazine, and don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click that bell. Um, So let's talk about the West Seattle Bridge replacement, right? Because I know you guys um, put in a, 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 not a bid, but a a, a A suggested proposal for it. (laughs) Um, and I know it was a little more spendy than what they were probably expecting, and you got some pushback. Well, what what is the about that about that type of of design and, and remodel that you guys think is is the best best way to go forward? I think what we saw was okay. We're going to go ahead and replace it with the same kind of the same kind of structure that was there, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe there's a couple variations, but basically it's the same formula, and. And we're looking at it going, well, but there's some other ways to do this that are maybe more appropriate to where we are. Maybe they actually have longer term benefit. They're more in line with, you know, biophilic design, with, uh, you know, sustainability. And, and the more we open that up and realize there were some other 
uh, precedence for a different approach to it around the world, the more excited we got about it. And you know, realizing that it probably was a political uphill battle, it still was a battle worth at least putting it out there. Exactly. And saying, here's another way to think about it and get people interested. And, and it may go nowhere, but we've already had other, other cities and mayors ask you know, for information about it because they're interested and excited about it. I think, I think that's the responsibility, right? When you think of business and design and innovation, it's like pushing the needle forward. Yeah. It's like, why do what's already been done? How can we innovate? How do we do some creative and at least question the norm? And so that, like in your case, in this case, other cities are might potentially look at it, or even even it might even you know trickle forward a little bit faster. Well, and you know we have this massive problem where we have uh, uh, decades of infrastructure that are are at critical points right now mm -hmm. across the whole U.S. And how are we going to replace all of those bridges? And there's there's a lot of them in every state, and uh, to just replace them with I, I guess I always am questioning doing what you've already done. Is that the best way? Yeah. Um, and and it seemed like this is an opportunity to demonstrate there is another way. There are a lot of value propositions in that, I think, around, first, we're in the Pacific Northwest, so using timber, and it's a hybrid model, mm -hmm. uh, but using timber, um, it makes a lot of sense. That's kind of how we got built as a region, and it's, it's, a, it's a natural resource we have. Um, a history and we have available to us and as we got dug into it more also the the strategy around building these bridges which many of them that are existing of this kind of hybrid model are in Scandinavia with very harsh climates uh, because of how they're componentized they actually can replace things over time and it, it has a longer lifespan so we're kind of going so okay, the long well, the, term the lifespan is yeah. longer the cost up front might be more but over the t over the total operational time it's it's at least equal, if not less, and it's a beautiful asset to the community. Blah 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 blah. So I, that's kind of where we talk about the dual hybrid. I know it's, it's 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 a timber and steel, and you to mention it kind of briefly. It being a representation of the environment, right? What talk about that within design? I think that's an interesting aspect. People that aren't in design want to know is like, how do you stay true to the environment in which you're designing upon, and how do you implement that with technology, and how do you push it forward? You know, it really gets into, as you start to test the engineering, you start to model these components in different configurations. So the timber solves some things, but not all things on a bridge, depending on how long it is and what kind of loads, all that. It, that, that lets you sort of add to the mix in the right ways to solve it from a structural standpoint. And that's where you end up with these uh, hybrid models of, you know, some components are steel, some components are concrete, some components are mass timber. Timber does better in compression than in tension and other so other materials. So it's really just mixing the materials to, gotcha. in, a, in an efficient and logical way that are available to us. And what we saw from existing product or the usual solution is just steel and concrete, steel and concrete. Yeah, going, okay, it's already well. true. That's what everyone does all the time. It's like, how do we do something new? Speaking of, you know, I couldn't have you leave. So talk about Captain Kirk. How does that influence you <laughs> as a business, as an entrepreneur, as someone in design? Because I know you're a fan. I know it's either or, right? You're either a Star Wars or Star Trek. Usually, obviously you're a Captain Kirk fan. How does that, how does that influence what you do? As a kid growing up watching Star Trek, Star Trek always focused on, um, you know, a future that was that was improving all the time and people were improving and and would tackle uh, often difficult issues that were in society during the years that it ran as a TV series. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of firsts and I, I appreciated that. And as I've seen over the years, they write sequels and spinoffs and everything else. Again, it's still showing a hopeful version of the future where we're, uh, we're evolving. And uh, I think that that's kind of how I overlay it into thinking about our practice. Um, the reason that, that our sandbox, which is a unique meeting space, uh, looks a little like the bridge of the enterprise probably isn't a coincidence. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it is kind of a kind of space that you feel empowered to uh, explore in. And that was kind of the intent of it. Absolutely. So I have a few rapid, rapid fire questions. And I'm going to spit these out at you. You can just give us the first answer that comes to mind. So who has been your go-to form of entertainment during the pandemic? 
<laughs> wow. Um, I don't get to decide that entirely on, on my own. <laughs> my wife has a big say in what, right. what comes up on the screen. So there's usually a, a, a solid mix of HGTV related things. There you go. And then whatever we're binging on that, that particular month. Uh, next question. Where do you tend to do your best creative thinking? Usually when I'm in the Redwoods. Okay. So I have a place down in Sonoma that we go to chunks of the year, well, particularly in the summer, that was my wife's family built it in the 30s or something. And I find when I'm there, I get a clearer head and I can start being a little more imaginative. And, and also it reminds me of biophilic design because the Redwoods themselves are so amazing and the, the entire uh, ecosystem that lives way up in those trees that you never see and it kind of just opens up your mind about you know how how could we design things that would be that would give people the same feeling of comfort that these trees provide or that this environment creates definitely what advice do you have on helping get out of a mental or creative block <laughs> change something i mean it's like uh, go to some place you haven't been before or mm -hmm. do something differently uh reach out to somebody that you haven't talked to in a while i mean I, we were talking about we're, we're working on this uh, a new version of the sandbox and we're talking about how can we change the color and feeling of the ceilings and walls and space which we can do with projection and lighting now mm -hmm. so that if you wanted to have a discussion with a group of people say you were coming up with a new idea for a wine or something you could make it feel like you were in a wine cellar in the same space gotcha. so that you could sort of facilitate feeling that so I think it's yeah, about the mood. change something, change the mood. We, we were, we're so much more, uh, not that design hasn't always been about understanding how to create an experience for people, but now we have data that supports how Absolutely. to do that. And, and then, of course, the pandemic has also created sort of uh, more, uh, more understanding of when it's not there and, and how you change. I mean, we're all dealing with the situation of uh, it's unique to have a meeting like this right now. Refreshing. You, you, yeah, it's great. It's great. <laughs> Usually you're just looking at the, the monitor and wishing that you, you know, trying to, trying to understand the body language of a person that you can only see the, this much. <laughs> it's like, I was, oh, I get it. I was literally talking about it yesterday. I was like, when I first did a Zoom webinar where it was just a black screen. And I'm used to being in person and or in front of a crowd. I'm like, that was the worst experience ever. And then finally I got to see someone's face. But this, this is like, you know, a whole new world. Uh, last one. How do you take your coffee or tea? How do I take my coffee or tea? So I, I have a, a very specific regimen for coffee. Okay. <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a perfect Seattle question. Yeah. Uh, um, so years ago, we... My wife and I started drinking a, an Italian coffee, and and literally it has been like ten years that we always have that particular coffee. Okay. And over the years, she's added things to it to make it healthier and better for us. So I literally have a regimen when I go down in the morning where I have a scoop of this and a scoop of that and a scoop of the. By the time I'm finished, I just add a little cream and it's ready to go. It's good. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Found out so thank much. You. Appreciate. I, I love the idea of business within design and the analytic aspect and, and how that directs and actually opens up creativity. And uh, look forward to seeing more and hopefully that, that bridge. You guys are able to want to do it. Okay.